So I'm going to spend the next few minutes taking you through um, the recent High Court case of SAP and Diageo. Um, so the, the case itself sort of dates back to May 2004. And in May 2004, Diageo licensed a number of SAP products, including SAP's ERP and process integration software. They used that software for financial reporting and planning to manage their manufacturing and supply chain and to manage their HR functions. Um, as is typical for this type of arrangement and this type of software, the license fee is calculated by reference to different categories of named users. So different types of use by different individuals within the organization cost different amounts of money depending on the extent of the functionality that each category of user needs. In addition to the standard license fee, there was a maintenance fee of about 17 to 20% payable per year. The second piece of software that's quite relevant for the judgment is what's called PI, that is SAP Process Integration. And this piece of software facilitates communication between different systems. So it, it allows different programs within SAP to communicate with each other, but it also enables Diageo to allow other software programs or other functionality to communicate with SAP's ERP system. This was subject to a separate set of um, terms and it was costed slightly differently. So here, fees for sending messages between SAP systems um, were free of charge, but there was a per message fee charge for each message sent between SAP's systems and a non-SAP system that's run by Diageo. It's worth pointing out here that at this point, this was an on-premise installation um, of the software. Um, it was installed on, on hardware provide, provided by Oracle originally. So over a period of years, Diageo used the software and there was no issues. As things began to change and as new technologies were developed, in 2011 and 2012, Diageo decided to develop two new systems based on Salesforce.com's platform, which is um, a web-based <coughs> platform that allows you to access their services through a web browser. The first system, which they called Connect, was um, in it, it enabled Diageo's operations managers, sales reps, um, customer relations managers within the business to manage how sort of call outs to customers, business development issues that needed to be resolved. Um, the second piece of software was an app um, that enabled customers to directly and on their own behalf. Um, manage their business accounts. Sorry, I've gotten the names mixed up there. Um, so the Connect system, uh, it's worth just pointing this out, replaced Diageo's call center. Um, so rather than you as Diageo's customer calling up and saying, please can you deliver me X number of barrels of this type of beer or ale, the customer did that themselves through the Salesforce.com platform. Both Salesforce.com platforms interacted with SAP's ERP through 
the PI functionality. The court goes into quite a lot of detail on how this works actually, and it, 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 it does help with the analysis. But essentially, two to three times a day, the systems would talk to each other so that the information that was in Connect and Gen 2 mirrored that which was in the ERP and vice versa. <coughs> This is a very simplified diagram um, of, of the setup, but but you will it, it gives you at least the visual representation of, of sort of the separate systems and the communication <coughs> by the PI. So fast forward a few years, um, Diageo was never intentionally obtuse, or was sort of was never misleading to Diageo with respect to its use of these two new systems. Um, but a couple of years later, obviously, SAP realized that they could be entitled to some more money here. Um, and they said to Diageo, look, we think that these two new systems that you've created directly or indirectly use or access our ERP software. Oh, and by the way, um, you owe us approximately 54 million in fees. Um, and just to give you the context, up until this point, the fees incurred by Diageo were in the region of 50 to 60 million over the life of the contract from 2004. Um, so, so it was against that background that the court was asked to look at the terms of the license to determine whether or not the use by Gen2 and Connect was something that was within the scope of the license and thus chargeable. Um, in order to make that determination, the court looked quite closely at the terms of the license grant. Um, and it looked at the definition of named user. Um, and the, the key points here are that we have an individual representative of a number of different types of entities or enterprises who are granted the right to access the software, so directly or indirectly. And, and, and sort of from SAP's perspective, helpfully here, it refers to use via the internet or access via the internet or a third party system. So in looking at the, the sort of the meaning of the contractual provisions, the High Court applied the usual rules of contractual interpretation. Um, and, and just as a recap, in performing this exercise, the purpose of the review is to ascertain the intention of the parties by asking what a reasonable person, having all of the background knowledge which would have been available to the parties, would have understood by the language used in the contract. So here the focus is on the meaning of the relevant words in their documentary, factual and commercial context. Um, and in, in performing that test, you need to look at the natural and ordinary meaning of the clause or the wording at issue, other relevant contractual provisions, the overall purpose of the clause and the contract, the facts and circumstances that were known or assumed by the parties, crucially here, at the time the document was executed, not at the time that the review was performed. Um, you can take commercial common sense into account, but you must disregard subjective evidence of a party's intentions, which is essentially saying, if SAP comes up and say, we think this, and Diageo says, no, we think that, actually, <laughs> sort of, that is not to be given any sort of evidential weight or burden, and the court needs to take a step back from that. So applying those rules, um, the, the court decided that on the plain and obvious meaning, the words of the license 
provided that only named users were authorized to access and use the ERP. And furthermore, the extent of that permitted use and access depended on the type of user that you were. So although the, the license agreement didn't define use, access, or direct or indirect, um, the court was of the view that the plain and obvious meaning of the word use here was application or manipulation of the ERP software. Um, and the plain and obvious meaning of access was acquiring visibility of or connection to the MySAP software. So you can see on that sort of interpretation of the language of the license how the court got to the conclusion that actually the use made by Connect and Gen2 was something that should have been paid for. Um, and this was irrespective of the fact that Diageo paid the PI fees for the messages that were between the SAP ERP systems and Connect and Gen2. And here the Diageo had argued that actually the PI functionality is a gatekeeper license and by paying for the transfer of the messages back and forth, that should have been sufficient to legitimize the use um, of, of that sort of transfer between the systems. The court disagreed with this and said no, actually the fees payable for PI are separate to and independent of the fees payable for a named user access under the license agreement. Having reached that conclusion, the court then looked to see whether the categories of named user that were specified in the license agreement, um, whether there was one or two of those that may be relevant and that may capture this type of use. As it turns out, that wasn't the case. So there was no description of a type of user that directly mapped across to the type of use that Diageo was sort of making of the ERP through Connect or Gen2. The fact that that specific category didn't exist in the license was not sufficient um, from the court's perspective to find that actually this type of use was permissible without payment. So they, they still found for SAP on this basis. Um, so that's broadly speaking where the courts got to on the construction of the software license terms. We will say that, and the court said this in the judgments, that they didn't actually look at the question of damages or fees that would be charged for this use. So that was due to be addressed in separate proceedings or probably more likely a settlement will be reached between SAP and Diageo with respect to that use. Um, to give you a feel for what's happened um, over the last few years, um, you saw on the earlier slide the definition of named user. The current version of SAP's on-premise um, general terms and conditions has taken a much more detailed and actually explicit approach to these types of issues. So they've taken the step of actually defining what they mean by use rather than leaving it undefined for the court to interpret. Um, and as you can see, it talks about activation of the processing capabilities of the software, loading, executing, accessing, or employing the software, or displaying information resulting from such capabilities. Under this definition, I think it's clear that Diageo's use falls squarely within um, this. And in addition to the use definition, they've gone a step further. further. Um, 
And the, 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 the wording here is the last sentence in, in sort of the, the grant clause, which is to say that use may occur by way of an interface delivered with or as part of the software, a licensee or a third party interface or another intermediary system. So it, it, it's, it's very explicit now from the terms of the new on-premise GTCs that this type of use that Diageo made would in fact be chargeable. There are a number of examples of similar wording that you will find <coughs> in um, T's and C's from all of the main big software vendors and they've gone down the road of trying to be as express and prescriptive and detailed as possible in terms of what things you can do with the software or what you can do with that software and another piece of software or another system that are within the scope of the license and that are subject to charge. So just as a quick recap, I think coming out of the, the, this particular question in, in the case, there are a number of questions that it Prudent to ask when looking at the license grant and the use that you're making of the software. And it's worth bearing in mind here as well that traditionally, if, if it's a legacy system and it's been in place for a long period of time, chances are the document that you've signed is five, ten, maybe more years old. So it may not envisage new developments in software. So the first thing we will check is to see is whether the software is on premise or in the cloud. There's different considerations um, for each type of use. Um, the next thing to check then is what's the term of the license? Is it term limited? Is it perpetual? Um, can it be split? Can you as the customer share the license? Can you grant sub-licenses to third parties? Are those third parties allowed to access it? How frequently, and this will move on to this um, in a couple of minutes, how frequently can your <coughs> software provider check whether your use of the software is in compliance with the license terms? What's the impact of a failure to comply with the usage rights by the license terms? It's just worth pausing here for a second. Is obviously, if your software provider is alleging that you are using the software outside the scope of the license terms, there's potentially a breach of contract claim. But there may also be a claim for copyright infringement because most of these software products are actually um, protected by copyright. Um, and finally, if this does happen and you are in a situation where your software provider is saying you're in breach, you owe us significant amounts of money to legitimize this previous use, how are you going to resolve that? What type of risk are you comfortable accepting? And you know, Richard touched on this earlier. Are you comfortable or is it acceptable to pay the license fees because actually they may be less than the cost of having to find a new provider and transition to that new provider. <coughs> Turning then to the second point in the case um, and this concerned how SAP was permitted to check whether Diageo's use of the software was permitted under the contract. Um, so clause 3.9 in the general terms of conditions was a, a relatively standard um, audit clause that entitled SAP to check Diageo's use of the software via tools provided by SAP. Um, this, again, historically has, has, has been the type of clause like the license grant that's sort of been treated as, as boilerplate. Um, 
But I think we're seeing now that actually the extent of the rights granted to the provider um, are key here. Dia so Diageo complied with SAP's request to use specific tools that verified sort of access to and interaction with the ERP system. Diageo claimed that actually because they hadn't been allowed themselves to access the salesforce.com platforms for Connect and Gen2, that that wasn't sufficient and that Diageo wasn't complying with clause 319 and their right to audit the software. The court here sided with Diageo and they said, look, Diageo have complied not just with the spirit but with the letter of 3.19. They installed the software tools that you asked them to install. They ran them and they provided the reports back to you. They've never hidden any of this use of <coughs> an interaction between the systems. And the court said that because of that compliance, SAP did not need to actually itself log in and access the Gen2 and the Salesforce.com platforms. Um, so I think the takeaway here is to look very closely at the terms of the audit clause. Um, think about why the provider needs those rights. What's its purpose? Is its purpose to check compliance with named user categories, with access rights? Is it broader than that? Who is entitled to conduct the audit? Is it the software provider themselves? Or is it a third party on that software provider's behalf? And if that's the case, what terms are applicable to that third party's um, performance of the audit? Where will that audit be performed? Will it be done on premise? Or will it be done remotely? And there are there has been increasing use of sort of remote, aud remote audits and functionality that allows suppliers to um, remotely audit use of their software. And generally, this, this particular point on sort of monitoring compliance or monitoring um, sort of use cases, it's a throwaway sentence in the license, which says something like, you know, the customer agrees that the provider may install certain functionality to check compliance with the license. And that's very broad. Um, it doesn't specify when, it doesn't specify how, it doesn't specify what, what, the, what the potential impact is. Um, but it allows them to do all of this in a very short form, one line sentence. Um, so once you've decided the why, who, and where, the next question is what exactly are we auditing? Are we auditing categories of named users? Are we auditing general use? Are we order, auditing sort of access to systems? Are we looking at how materials have been shared? There are many different variations here. Um, and then once you've decided that the audit will happen, how will that happen? Will it be, again, done on site? Will it be done remotely? Um, will the auditor be accompanied by a representative of the customer at all times? Who pays for it? Um, and generally here, it's sort of as is the standard approach in audit clauses, the, um, in the event that there is an underpayment of fees, the fees are then payable by the customer. Uh, then two other things to think about. The first one is if you are the customer, um, do you want an obligation to further flow down the audit rights to subcontractors or other named third parties that are using the software? <coughs> um, and finally, if there is a dispute, again, what happens? Uh, 
do you go to an expert to, to make a determination based on the findings of the audit, and that could be binding for both parties, or, or, or do, you, do you want to sue for breach of contract? Um, to sum up then, key points from the case are, first of all, contract here is key. The terms that are written in your contract with your software provider are very important and, and are becoming more so now. Terms that relate to use, access, payment, um, interaction with other systems, audit rights and termination rights need to be express, precise and clear. such that both parties can look at the terms and try and figure out actually what's chargeable, what's not, or where there's a breach or where there's not. The, the difficulty obviously, and Richard will come on to this shortly, is, 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 to, is to try and future-proof that drafting or future-proof that, you know, the positions that you take based on those terms. I think what we're saying is, when you're negotiating the contract, it's really important to treat these clauses as very key clauses rather than just as, oh yeah, that's SAP standard terms and conditions for software licenses. They don't negotiate it, it's fine. Um, and once you've done that and you've signed, it's now more important that you continually review whether your use and, and sort of new business practices and processes are still in compliance with the terms of the software license. So it's not a case of sticking it in the drawer and forgetting about it for a few years until it's a dispute. Um, the, the impact of the case, and we, we've seen this uh, recently, I was in a, um, in a negotiation with SAP a couple of weeks ago, um, and we found actually when we compare that negotiation to previous negotiations with them before the case came out they've certainly become more aggressive um, and they're much less likely to agree changes to these types of provisions because they want to have as broad rights as possible um, and i think that if there is a dispute about fees or about scope of use and you reach a settlement and the likelihood is that actually most people will want to reach a settlement. <coughs> it's important to make sure that in addition to saying, okay, on a going forward basis, this is the type of use of these are the fees, that the there is also a, a sort of a waiver or a release or a statement from the provider that in sort of signing the amendment or agreeing to pay the additional fees, that legitimizes all use prior to that date, so that there is so that it's completely watertight from the customer's perspective, that they can't come back to you if something else transpires. So um, this is a little uh, just a teaser of, of, of what's to come. Um, we want to take sort of the, the commercial and the legal points that Richard um, referred to earlier and have a look at sort of the impact of this um, in the future. So in the beginning, software was one license per machine. It was no blocked. Your provider said to you, you, can, you must install this on machine A, you can make a single copy for backup purposes. As things have developed, it's moved more towards what's on the right hand side of the screen. So rather than the individual sitting at their desk and logging on, you may have a mobile app, you may have um, web browser <coughs> functionality like in SAP and DSU. There may be APIs or plugins that Communic allowed communication with different systems, and then finally, you know, there, there may be separate communications with different software and servers. Um, 
um, to give you an idea of, of, uh, of how, so this slide represents um, the SAP business objects platform um, system architecture. Now, this is now a couple of years old, but you can see how we've moved from one license on one machine to a myriad of different processes, connections, communications across various different types of, of sort of systems and servers. So you've processing servers, you've web access, you've uh, client application access, you've desktop access, mobile, etc. So when you get to this type of um, system architecture and setup, actually the, to perform the exercise of checking through all of the different types of use um, and making sure that you have the right licenses in place, it, it becomes more difficult as technology develops. 